you vote for a candidate who wants to end wars, end surveillance, promote free speech, and heal the cultural divides that are destroying our world? No, neither would I. Let's stick with the guys we've got. Hello there, you 6.4 million Awakening Wonders. Thanks for joining me on this voyage to truth and freedom at a time when we are being divided, at a time when we are being censored, at a time when the right to protest is being shut down and the police are being armed with military equipment. Isn't it time that we had a conversation about change? Turn on the notification bell and subscribe right now because they will direct you towards the mainstream and the mainstream will direct you towards nullifying lies and stuff. Dumb, spellbound, staring, switching you off and shutting you down. We want you to have hope. We want you to be free because I know that your freedom and my freedom are ultimately integrated. That's why I was fascinated to talk to RFK. He may be a legacy candidate with the most famous last name in American politics. I don't know, Lincoln, Washington, decide for yourself. But he also is interested in some pretty crazy policies like bringing home the troops, making sure that military expenditure goes towards military personnel rather than the military industrial complex, ending wars, ending constant surveillance, disbanding deep state organisations that are ultimately spying on the population. In short, he seems to care about the things that you and I care about. Individual freedom, live and let live, love one another, love one another. Let's try to change the world meaningfully and recognise that that means not doing what we've always done and doing some things that we've never done before. When I spoke to RFK, I felt that it's possible to change the world as well as necessary. Stay to the end of the conversation. Let me know in the comments and the chat if you believe it's possible to change the world. If you've noticed the number of ways that they work day and night to prevent us from getting free. It seems like what we are confronting is the kind of thing that we talk about continually on this channel. There are some extremely powerful and malevolent forces at work that are willing to push their agenda through veils of morality and reason that most people wouldn't contemplate. Your pledges for becoming president include bringing the troops home and spending that money on US infrastructure, healing the cultural divide rather than using the culture war to polarize the country, dismantling the surveillance state and pardoning Assange and Snowden. Even those changes would indicate a significant shift in, uh, you know, American domestic life and of course I suppose therefore the world but given the power of these institutions and the scale of the challenge what do you think is more likely to happen uh, do you think that there is enough democracy in America for your campaign to make a significant impact and surely a machine this nefarious would ultimately just come up with a way to prevent such a, a fatal attack on its modus operandi. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I love what you talk about on this uh, podcast all the time, which is uh, this uh, the 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 healing power of love of um, of uniting people from the left, the left and the right in a populist rebellion against these, you know, this superstructure. And I don't know if it will work, but that's what I'm trying to do. Now I'm I'm going to go forward as if I believed that it was going to work, and I'm seeing. Um, you know, the tremendous power coming from, you know, people now, more and more people on the left are joining my campaign. I had, you know, I had calls this week from Jeffrey Sachs, from Ralph Nader, from many other kind of liberal leaders who are, you know, part of the, the superstructure of the, you know, liberal uh, democracy forever. And, um, and of course, on the right, um, you know, the, the groups that used to, that were vilifying each other and continue to vilify each other. The profit of that, you know, of that cabal that you're talking about, the uniparty cabal, um, the worst thing that they can imagine is that we can, uh, that we can unify the far left or far, and far right in a, in a, uh, in a revolution against this corrupt merger of state and corporate power. And that is, you know, my plan. That's what I'm going to try to do. I, um, and, you know, so far things are, are going well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's extraordinary, Robert. My God, it's so fascinating 
to speak with you and to listen with you. In a sense, I think for a lot of us, somebody with your heritage, your ability to communicate, your ability to marshal facts, your durability, your willingness to enter into this debate, your pedigree when it comes to your victories as a lawyer against corporations, your history of supporting significant environmental issues, your ability to construct very complex narratives. For me, this is... The, a great opportunity for democracy and for the planet. I must confess to at times feeling sort of startled by the depth and um, malfeasance of some of the conspiracies that you describe. But I'm, you know, I, obviously for me, you are an incredible opportunity for all of us. And I suppose if Donald Trump ca can rise out of the libertarian right as a quite kind of a berserker figure that rhetorically reaches anger, having someone that's sort of like on the side of a liberal value use real freedom, holding power to account, ending war, attacking corporate power, bringing people together is precisely what's needed. So we'll do everything we can in our own way to join you in this suicidal campaign that will end with us all being murdered. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what happens. I mean, it really is kind of an experiment. It's a uh... It's kind of a sociological experiment, um, you know. And, I mean, we just had a big mass experiment performed on the American people over the past three years. And for me, this is a new kind of experiment. Uh, if you try to, you know, do this with kind of love and reason and truth, whether that can have a unifying effect the same way that fear and intimidation and you know and marginalization and polarization and gaslighting that orchestrated uh, propaganda campaign that we saw over the last uh, three years during COVID, whether there's some counterbalancing force in the universe that can be summoned and you know and deployed to actually bring people together and to um and to get them to challenge these not only the, the dominant narratives but these institutions that have been I, I can tell you something I know I've spent 40 years pursuing these agencies and I know how to fix them. I know how to, you know, I I, I asked Ron DeSantis at one point, um I asked him I had breakfast with him one day and I I asked him during COVID when he was kind of doing, he was doing, you know, really good stuff in Florida on the COVID issue, uh, you know, really trying to have a science-based response. And he asked me at that point to have a breakfast with him. And I went over there and talked to him, to him and I said, uh, and he was, we talked about him possibly running for presidency. And I said, how will you handle NIH? And he said, I'll burn it to the ground. And I, you know, I, I understand the impulse um, but um, I think I have a uh, can, I can ha have a more surgical impact on these agencies because I've spent forty years suing them. I've spent forty years studying them. I have a PhD and thinking about how do you fix these corrupt col uh, corporate cultures and at the same time honor the people who are in those agencies to do something good. You know, we talked about. Uh, I know you and I have never met. But we have um, my granddaughter was was friends with your uh, your daughter at school, and my, her mother, my you know my daughter in law, Amaryllis Fox, who's married to my oldest son, was a CIA agent for most of uh, the clandestine services for most of her career, and she's one of the most honorable and most courageous people that I've ever met. And she says that the, the twenty two thousand people who work for the CIA, most of them are are good patriotic American citizens who want it, who, who who gravitated to that agency because they're idealistic. And so, um, but you know, it's like all of these agencies, the people who ra rise up in the agencies and get these permanent, you know, uh, beachheads of power, like Anthony Fauci, who's there for 50 years. And he lasts for 50 years for the same reason he rose, which is he's in the tank with industry. He's part of the, you know, this, uh, this dynamic of agency capture where these agencies are, are you know, become the, uh, the sock puppets for the industries they're supposed to regulate. And, you know, NIH and CDC and FDA are, ca are captured by big pharma. 
EPA is captured by the chemical industry, the pesticide. And when I sued Monsanto, you know, my team, we found, we we went through discovery documents, uncovered them. That uh, we found these emails, extraordinary emails, where it showed that the head of the pesticide division for almost a decade, Jess Rowland, was secretly working for Monsanto the entire time. And this is true throughout these agencies. You know, I've sued USDA and, and Smithfield and Cargill and Monsanto and the, and the, the you know, the industrial agriculture and meat processing facilities, which own that agency. And if you look at the CIA, it's a captured agency too, but it's captured by the military industrial complex. And, um, you know, I know what I would do with the CIA, which is the same thing my father would do which is not to burn it to the ground, but to separate the espionage division, which is what it's supposed to be doing. Espionage is, um, is information gathering and analysis, and we need that function at CIA, and we need those people to be happy with their agency and proud of their agency and, and performing better than anybody else in the world. Uh, but it should, But the attachment of that agency to the clandestine division is corrupting to the entire process because the, you know, the... Um, the problem with with all the clandestine operations, there's no accountability. You know, nobody. And and if the espionage division is part of that, they end up justifying all of these black ops rather than saying, okay, let's take a look at the long term blowback, not just the short term. You know, uh, objective. So, for example, the CIA believes. If they if they look at the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, they say that's a success story because they got rid of him. But then we spend eight trillion dollars. We kill more Iraqis than Saddam Hussein. We turn Iraq into a proxy for Iran. It, it's it's an incoherent nation that's just a series of uh, warring death squads between Shia and Sunni. And we create ISIS and we drive 2 million refugees into Europe and destabilize democracy in every country in Europe and probably, you know, have something to do with Brexit. And so if you look at all of the blowback and then say, was it a good idea to overthrow Saddam Hussein? You know, the answer would be no, it wasn't. The same is true with, with the CIA's overthrow of Yoko, Jacob R. Benz in Guatemala. And, you know, we're still paying the price in 1953 with all the Guatemalans lined up at our border trying to get in because that country has never regained its stability through all of these military interventions and CIA machination. Look at Iran. You know, every Iranian knows that we overthrew the, you know, first democratically elected government of uh, uh, Mohammed Mossadegh in 1954. And are that you know all the all of this turmoil coming out of Iran and the antagonism and hatred of our country it wasn't unjustified. We, you know, claiming that we were a lover and promoter of democracy, we went in because Mossadegh was going to give a better deal to his people in their oil revenues, and we we're going to undermine Texaco, which Alan Dulles, another client of Alan Dulles's, and BP. And so we overthrew him. You know, so while saying that we want to promote democracy around the world, we're destroying that. And then we have now 70 years of blowback, and nobody ever does any accountability on any CIA operation. If you do a drone strike against a family in the middle of Afghanistan, you say, okay, we made our objective, we killed the terrorists. But what happens generationally? That sends out ripples of hatred and ripples of revenge and vendetta that never go away. And, you know, have you eliminated more hatred than you've created? Those are the questions that a real intelligence agency needs to be answering. Um, the real intelligence agency needs to be looking at our dependence on foreign oil. And what that does to our country, is that really the biggest national security threat to America? Oh, these are the kind of, this is what I will create, the, you know, recreate the CIA to be doing this. I know exactly what my father was going to do. That's what he was going to do. He was going to divide those two functions because he saw that they were corrupting. Well, there you go. RFK, Marianne Williamson, and I'm sure there are candidates across the political spectrum who are interested in communicating about important subjects that could change the world rather than just representing the donor class. Let me know what you thought of it in the chat. We will be back on Rumble every single day from June 5th. Join us there for our hour-long show with comedy, laughs, exposition, and exposure of important issues 
daily. If you enjoyed this video, have a look at either of these. Remember, turn on the notification bell right now so that you get this content. We make it every single day. And from June the 5th, we're going to have some fantastic, exciting guests every day that you are going to love. More important than any of that is that you please stay free.